to American Warrior Radio, uh, where we bring you the news that's great for veterans and their families and special guests such as we have today. Um, we're on AM 1300 WMEL and Worldwide 1300 WMEL.com. So we're out there all over the place. And today it's our honor to have Tech Sergeant Dan Warren, a pararescueman, a, a PJ as it were for the short title. And he was telling us some of the training that were that's required of them to go through. And I think there was a couple of schools left after all those you covered so far. Yes, sir. It takes. It took me about two and a half years. And, wow. Uh, wow. It's that's a, commitment right there. It's a long time. Maybe a master's degree or something to come out of it, but uh, you get a Maroon Beret, and uh, it's a pretty coveted thing. Last school being what we call Pararescue University, where we put it all together, all the ropes, all the medicine, all the mountain, all the uh, air ops and jumping and, and small team tactics. We're able to uh, put it all together, and it culminates in a ceremony that's that's pretty unique, and uh, all the veterans and all of the uh, the past PJs and present PJs, all the command come in, and, and you know you become one of the family. And it was a it was a it was a pretty big event for me. And uh, wow, it must have been. Is yeah, there any yeah. way that the audience, the folks out there in American Warrior Radio Land, can get a little taste of that? Is there something online about you know the, the not necessarily the pomp and circumstance, but the ceremonial aspect of it? Sure. Uh, there's a couple of things. If you go on YouTube and look up Rescue Warriors, uh, it's actually a pretty thorough documentation of from start to finish the whole pipeline. And uh, it's made a little while ago, but it's pretty accurate. On, on. Uh, Are you in it? I'm not. Thankfully, <laughs> uh, a couple of guys that were used to be a Patrick are in it. Um, guys that are still out in the career field, they're definitely in it. But it, it, I think it's the best consolidated um, I, glimpse of what we go through. And we've had a lot of discussion about our awesome PJs here, and that the fact the fact that the Air Force has, you know, the penultimate degree of specialized warrior, the special operators. Now, not to put down the Navy SEALs, obviously, or the the Green Berets, or any of the other special operators and the other services. But the interesting thing about the PJs are, when those guys get in a fix, who rescues them? Ta-da! Am I right? We, we like to... Be, I know, see, like that's just He's being humble man, and modest, <laughs> but come on. Let's just brass tacks, baby. Just like Marcus Luttrell on the mountainside in the Hindu Kush. Who went to get him? Uh, Colonel McCrander was was one of the pilots carrying some PJs to go. See, nine twentieth rescue. But that was not, he wasn't alone. There was Rangers. There of was course, all sorts of air assets. But led by the Air Force para rescue jumpers. Let's be honest. You guys are specially trained, Skinny not just there. in the the elements of warfare, but everything else you bring to the table that you just described in all those coursework that you did. Yes, yeah, sir. It's. Uh, it is what I guess. What we can stand on and put our hat, uh, you know, hang our hat on, is that we are the only job in the DoD that is specifically created for personal recovery. So uh, other Did guys do. Hear it. that? Say that again. So we are the only job in the Department of Defense that specifically trained and recruits for personnel recovery. So other jobs do it. Don't get me wrong. We're not the only show in town, but we are the only ones specifically. That is our bread and butter. And I wanted to share that. I wanted to highlight that because Colonel McCrander, who, hi, Colonel, how you doing, Skinny, uh, happens to be my co-commander with the Military Affairs Council. He was asked by the folks over there as he planned this mission, you know, yeah, but you're a reservist. Can you do it? That's exactly what you guys train for day in and day out. That's what you're ready to do. That's what you do. You put your lives on the line to go out there and save others, and you do so in magnificent ways, which is really what I'm excited about starting to cover here, Glenn. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And... Uh why don't we just jump right in there, and, and I know that you were recently awarded, uh, along with others, the McKay Trophy, which is, uh, well, tell our listeners a little bit about what that is. Sure, it's uh, the Clarence McKay Trophy. It's, you know, if you walk into the Air and Space Museum, it's this big, massive uh, golden bowl sitting on top of a, a large brown uh, pillar, and all on it is these little medallions that, that have names of people and air crew, and um, if you look at the base of it, it says Rooster 73, 74, and 75, Rooster Flight, and that was uh, a mission that I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of. And let's go into detail a little bit on this uh, McKay Award because it's only handed out once a year. What are, what are the guidelines behind that? How sure, it's the most meritorious flight of the year, and uh, it's, it's 
kind of, a, I guess it's a big deal in the Air Force, um, and uh, it's given to the, the, the flight that distinguishes itself as, as the most harrowing and dangerous and uh, stuff that can be learned the most in the career field uh, from. So this was, this mission that we're, I was received the McKay Trophy for was, uh, was a part of that. And that's administered through the National Aeronautic Association, not the DOD. Yes, sir. Uh, DOD uh, had a presence at the ceremony, but it is all the NAA. Very, very interesting. Okay, so you got this very special honor. You and how many others on the crew? Uh, there was three CV-22 air crews. So what I mean by that is that tilt rotor um, Osprey. Uh, so three Osprey crews and three PJs. Okay, let's jump right in. Tell us what happened. How did this come about? Sure. Um, we were out of uh, Djibouti, Africa, and uh, there was a evacuation mission at a complex in Bor, South Sudan. Um, there was a civil war going on, and uh, there was basically uh, a coalition force that was being surrounded by bad guys. I, I guess in its simplest form. And uh, so we, get that picture, people. Yeah, this is uh, Americans and and Australians and Africans and people that that are allies. Uh, a, a, a massive force of thousands were coming in on them to basically clear them out, kill them, or, uh, or, or 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 harm them. And so it's our obligation and the State Department's obligation to to yank those people out, and we're the force to do it. So uh, we went in with uh, three CV-22 uh, Ospreys. Which are cool aircraft. Do you like that platform? You know, I was, uh, you know, I've heard the stories that everybody else has about them and, uh, you know, I've flown on the NVs before in Afghanistan. This was my first exposure to the CVs and I, I swear by it. it. It saved my life. It's one of my, one of the best aircraft out there and especially for that theater. Okay, so we'll talk about why it lended itself to saving your life, but Go on, give us some details as to what happened next. Sure, uh, it was a, a few hour flight from uh, Djibouti to Su South Sudan, and uh, when we came into uh, the terminal area, it, this was also a daytime mission, when we came into the terminal area, each aircraft started taking uh, effective fire from multiple sources. Uh, each aircraft was hit over a hundred times with 7.62, 14 millimeter, 23 millimeter, uh, shot it by RPGs. And uh, it was a pretty chaotic event. As you're coming in, this is coming up to greet you. As we were switching from uh, the, the vertical to horizontal, I'm sorry, for horizontal to vertical mode, and uh, we started taking fire. And, uh, you know, we started seeing the ground start popping up all around us. Guys were holding water bottles that were splitting in half. Bullets were embedding in backpacks. Oh, um, Lord. And, uh, you know, there's not much you can do other than get small. Um, you know, thankfully, thank you know, thankfully, no, no one in my plane was injured. I think the biggest casualty were the uh, were all of our underwear at that point. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the the other aircraft was not so lucky. And uh, tell us about that, because you're um, flying in tandem with another Osprey. Correct. There's three Ospreys, and uh, you know, we were shot at. Um, so uh, this aircraft, the the tail gunner was hit in his plate, knocked on his back, uh, but otherwise okay. Um, we were. We were uh, alongside a security team, a special operations security team, and uh, they took significant, uh, significant wounded inside their aircraft. Uh, four guys were critically wounded. From um, from, sh from shrapnel or both. live rounds coming through. So the both, yeah, both live rounds um, and some of the strap shrapnel had kicked up when it came through the aircraft hull, and uh, you know, several of the pilots. They're, they're actually, their portion of the aircraft is, is armored, but uh, there were was, was several uh, bullet, bullet impacts at the head level that would have gotten them too, but thankfully it didn't happen. Uh, but it, a very chaotic day. Um, so we took significant fire on the ground. Um, four guys were injured in their lower body. One guy was shot in the back, um, and who happened to be the medic who, uh, who performed spectacularly despite it. And uh, he was actually just awarded Medic of the Year. Um, through his uh, community. God bless him. Yeah, he was uh, first first operational deployment, uh, first <laughs> operational mission, and uh, welcome he, to hell. He well, you know what? That was his job. He was the medic, and uh, and he knocked it out of the park. And you know, I was in another aircraft when this happened. And the yeah, PJs, tell us about that. You know, the PJs. We, we you know we checked to make sure we all had five fingers and five toes. Checked our buddies, and uh, after that, you know. You know, the the entire hull is starting to fill with smoke and fumes, fuels dripping all over us as we're as we're going. Because you're through. getting shot up, Correct. in the air. Well, we were able to to beat feet out of there, but that that was half the battle. At this point, the, the aircraft is waffling and shaking and basically barely hanging in the air. 
And uh, because of that, the air crew saved us all. And, uh, you know, from there, we couldn't land on the ground. You know, we wanted to have that aircraft land so we, we could go into the other aircraft and assist with the casualties. Because you knew there were injured in the other aircraft. Um, How do you know that? You guys are communicating back and forth? Yeah, we communicated through intercom system. And, uh, you know, I was able to get report about the status of patients and, uh, and most specifically their blood types. And that's, you know, the, the sole action piece that I think that we could affect uh, the outcome of these patients was, was getting their blood type and performing something called a walking blood bank. And, um, Tell us more. Walking sure. blood bank. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot like we had our hands tied behind our back. I can't treat these patients. I know a lot of them are bleeding. We're not carrying blood, which requires a lot of red tape, and, and, and it's a pain to get. This was a low threat, or billed as a low threat mission, so we couldn't bring blood. Uh, basically, what we did was we took blood from one guy, put it in a bag for administration to another guy. And uh, it's called a fresh whole blood. And uh, we found that, thankfully, three of the leadership part of the security team uh, were direct matches to the casualty that was most critical. And, uh, you know... It was hard to see their veins and stuff because it was so smoky and fuel leaking on us, but uh, we're able to draw blood, position air medical evacuation equipment, and ready to sprint off as soon as we landed in Entebbe, Uganda. Good Lord. So you find out there's severely injured folks on the other aircraft. Correct. And you're typing, not only getting their blood type, right. you're matching it up with people on your aircraft. There's specific kits for it, um, and... Uh, it's it's a it's a little bit of a process, but you know there's not a whole lot we can do after you know we're able to get guys out and scan and, and you know you have three idle PJ hands that only want to help. So this is the best we could do with the limited supplies and these are our buddies that are that are hurting in the aircraft. And it's Next quick to thinking too. Obviously you trained for this, but yes, had you ever done anything like that before? This is actually uh, it's not a very commonly used uh, tactic. In fact, it's it's kind of spread into our community after this event. Um, based on some of our after actions reports. But no, I had never done it. In fact, we learned, we got training on this a week before from a surgical team. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. See one, do one, teach Good one. Good timing. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, and, you know, that surgical team, it was a CRNA that taught us, a certified registered nurse anesthetist, and he's still one of my mentors today. Um, but uh, so with that blood and toe, uh, we, it was a waiting game. And so multiple air refuelings, the plane is shaking and going all over the place, and for an hour and a half, it was really just kind of, you know, making peace with yourself. And an and hour and a up. half. Yes, sir. Holy cow! Multiple. But you're out lakes. of the out of the immediate fire. You're Correct. trying to now get somewhere. Where were you headed to again? We were headed uh, to Uganda um, from Sudan, and uh, you know, our our part was was a pretty simple, laid back compared to the the chaos that was going in this other aircraft, where one medic shot in the back. Is delegating treatment to all his best friends with no other medics. So he's got four significant casualties. He's plugging up bleeders. He's he's uh, he's doing the best he can with pretty much what he's carrying on his belt. Um, and he's you know he's another uh, Jay Somsi grad who is uh, just a, a, a tremendous human being. He got Soma Special Operations Medic of the Year, uh, and and I can't credit him enough. But uh, when we get when we get on the ground. Um, it's just it's just PJ sprinting to patients. Okay, so the pilot was going to try and find a place to get you down so you could continue the next step. We vet. tried to find a, an HLZ, uh, you know, a landing zone, an impromptu landing zone. It wasn't happening. If those things landed, we were we were stuck, and we'd have to call the PJs from, from Djibouti <laughs> to jump in and PJs and calling on PJs. Yeah, okay. correct. I mean, they had their parachutes rigged up, ready to go, and in Djibouti, ready to help us out. Um, thankfully, it didn't have to happen. Um, when we landed in Uganda. Uh, we just sprinted off the back of that aircraft, and 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 I can't credit the aircraft because the enough. ramp opens. You have to jump out the side like the uh, we kept the, Well, the, the hydraulics were 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 shot up so bad. Interesting. That, that they kept the ramp open the entire flight. So. Wow. Um, so we uh, we basically. So not only you have the smoke and the hydraulic fluid leaking, you got the freaking door open. Well, we're all tied in, but uh, <laughs> it, it helped fumigate the inside of the cabin, which it, it didn't help a lot. But you know if. It, it almost looked like in the air show with that smoke that trails behind it. <laughs> yeah. It looked just like that. We saw GoPro wow. footage of it. It was pretty impressive. But, uh, <laughs> GoPro footage. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so basically, we, we land in Uganda and uh, and sprint to these guys, and, and they're in rough shape, man. Uh, but they, they the bleeding was stopped. 
and that guy did his part, man. He, uh, with literally a, a backpack full of gear, treating four critical patients. Wow. And so we get on the ground, and we, we take over kind of an advanced critical care portion. So he's done the immediate life threats. But what's going to kill these guys is blood loss, infection. Um, they need fluid replacement. So it's a lot of that tactical field care as opposed to care under fire, which he, which he provided. So we're able to just really designate PJs uh, to each patient, I kind of took over for the uh, the team leader up and out role, uh, documenting and, and allocating resources. They they diverted a large cargo aircraft for us to put these guys in, which was incredible. Um, they, they stripped all the gear off and said, hey, you're taking off to go get this guy to a hospital, period. And uh, and they did, but we, had to, we actually had to commandeer a van on the flight line, rip out all the seats and throw all the guys inside to get across the flight line to this aircraft. So... You can imagine it's just limbs and litters sticking out of the side of this truck in the middle of Africa, <laughs> <Good grief. laughs> doing wow. starting IVs and pushing blood. And but uh, you know, one of the most rewarding experiences of my life was uh, was seeing this guy. He was the most critical patient. Um, you know, gray, grayish skin. Normally a Samoan guy with darker skin, but it was gray and white. And after the second unit of blood, it just a flush came in with with uh, you know pink skin, and it was oh man, it was amazing. It obviously was rewarding. I'm looking at your face as you're telling that story. We're talking with Tech Sergeant Dan Warren from the 920th Rescuing. He is a pararescueman, or better, I mean, the vernacular PJ is really what you guys refer to yourselves as PJs, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so you'll see him with the red berets, but that is an amazing tale, and it really happened, people. And this is the the brand and the quality of warfighter we have out there, even within the Air Force. For all those people, Glenn, that say, "Ah, you're just a bunch of you know." desk jockeys or flyboys. Yeah, you stay in the hotels and <laughs> <laughs> you don't do anything hard. Saving lives, baby. <laughs> yeah. But you've done so much more in your career. How many years you got in right now? Uh, I got about f 11 active duty and 14 total. Excellent. And I, I want to get to the fact that you're going to be stretching your wings a little bit further here in a minute. But let's talk about a couple other of your experiences and actually awards because you got a bronze star for Valor too. As a uh, like Glenn always says, give us a high side pass because this was in theater Afghanistan. Sure, uh, it was. You know, I was part of a Pedro mission uh, where we did a lot of Kazavak. We're also, you know, do the the, the classical CSAR combat search and rescue mission. Um, but this was a down night, and the base was attacked by 15 insurgents that breached the wire and and did one of the most costly infrastructure attacks since the Tet Offensive. Wow. And I understand that they were camouflaged with American uniforms? Not only that, uh, so they were wearing um, ACUs, Army Combat Uniform, and uh, they had painter's masks on because they were all huffing paint that night, heavily armed with, oh, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, full-on machine guns, RPGs, and uh, they actually killed uh, two Marines that night. One of them was a commander, Lieutenant Colonel Rabel, who they, he was the spot at the Harrier Squadron where they came into the wire and, uh, and as soon as they came in, they started engaging his Harriers and his people. He got his people to shelter and started going after three guys with PKMs with his Beretta 9mm. Wow. And uh, they shot an RPG at him. It didn't hit him, but it hit up on a hangar, and, and unfortunately he, uh, he, uh, he passed away. And the guy's an absolute hero. And if you read some of his literature, it, it, it solidifies his status as a true hero. What part, what part did you play as all hell's breaking loose here? Um, you know, we, we had the night off that night, and the part I was playing was dead asleep on the couch um, oh. while this was happening. And, uh, you know, we, we got some calls on the radio that we really didn't believe were like somebody's messing with us. We walk outside, and across the flight lines, an absolute inferno. Uh, they had blown up the fuel depot, which was just feeding fuel and burning off into the air. It was probably a 200-foot flame that you could see from, you know, uh, from... Kandahar province, but uh, it was, uh, so, we're, and we're also seeing strafers and, and helicopters shooting at, uh, at stuff across the, the flight line, and uh, we're like, oh my god, you know, what, what's going on here? So we manned security positions, they asked for a small team to help out with casualties across the flight line, I threw my hand up, grabbed a med ruck, and jumped in a truck, and we, we went on, and, uh, you know, going across the flight line, it's completely blacked out, and, you know, three guys heavily armed in a truck with MVGs. Uh, night vision goggles, um, it, it, it puts people on edge because half the, uh, most of the base was out in their pajamas with M16s manning guard positions because they didn't know what the heck was going on. So every, everybody we ran into, you know, guys are drawn down on us and, you know, hey, we're Americans, but we're not insurgents. Nobody knew what was who. And Very chaotic. Right, it, was, it was a chaotic, but we made it work. 
and uh, you know we found a casualty collection point that was manned by the hospital, and uh, we found that injury uh, basically injured personnel. They had more enough people to, to man it, so we found that injured personnel were coming forward to the line, and that's where we needed to be, and we got there. And uh, getting there was was a harrowing task in itself. Um, apparently, we were being shot at while it was happening, but you know the entire time you're you're driving to uh, where the enemies were hung out in a liquid oxygen bunker, which. I don't need to tell you guys, but Locks, uh, baby, yeah. if, it, if it if it takes any kind of catalyst, like a like a flame or say a bullet, uh, that's the whole that's the whole side of the Good basis. Nice. Yeah, and they had like seven or eight of those massive containers. The whole place was on fire, um, and that's where the guys were. They were hung out in a bunker there. So we had to we had to kind of beat feet to a into a to a British held position, and uh, we're hey, where's your wounded? We're here to help, and uh, and we were able to integrate into their scheme of maneuver and do close quarters combat inside and clear out that locks facility. Uh, and inside that bunker were bad guys. And, uh, you know, we actually didn't do the direct engagement on that first portion, but a small, you know, three-man British team came around, and all you heard was, oh, my God, and full automatic fire and a large bang. And what happened was there was five insurgents in there. British go open up full automatic fire. A bad guy throws a grenade at them. It bounces off the top of the bunker and back at him, and they all blow up. Oh wow! It's a uh, it's a kinetic Praise night. God. Praise um, God! And and you ended up with a bronze star for valor out of this. Yeah, there was there was still a, an event after that. Um, so we pressed north into the Harrier squadron. These guys originally came in. Fifteen guys. They spread out in groups of five, and uh, we fanned out with this team, uh, clearing this hangar bay. And you know, there's Harriers on fire, cooking off thirty millimeter rounds all all over the place. And uh, they they did a number on the on the place. There's bodies you know, littered in between tea barriers with that green hue where they're huffing paint and uh, heavily armed, their weapons scattered all over the place. And uh, as we cleared through the area, uh, there was still one insurgent that was uh, that was alive. And, uh, you know, he, he had some he had some armament on him. And, Not uh, after you got through with him. And we were able to engage him and, and take him down. But uh, Well, phenomenal job, yeah. and they recognize it, and that's something that's going to be part of your resume forever. Let's talk about your resume, though, because, folks, this is the... It long spirited edition and long awaited edition of American Warrior Radio's runway report. We've got Tech Sergeant Dan Warren. We've only got a couple minutes left. You got some great news coming up in in your career. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, in the past week, uh, I was I was offered a, a commission as a lieutenant um, O1E at uh, the Alaska Air National Guard's an AGR. Congratulations! What's an AGR wow, for those great. that don't know? An active guard reserve uh, combat rescue officer. And then in that same week, I found out that my wife was pregnant. <laughs> Ooh, what a week! Double <laughs> blessing. That's phenomenal. Yes, so sir. you're going to Alaska? I am. Yeah, I'm very excited. That was the team that that uh, Komatsu Bear uh, Menchu that we did this base attack with. Exactly. And folks, I just we can't even begin to touch on or pay enough credit to everything this man has done, as well as his crew members and the pair rescue jumpers in general, Glenn. But there's so much more online. Give them a couple of quick tidbits. Where can they find out more about you? Certainly the 920th Rescue Wing. Yeah, I, I would go to the, the, the 920th Rescue Wing uh, site, and uh, I think that's a good start. You can just search, just put in the search word Dan Warren, and you're going to see all kinds of great stories. Please don't. No. <laughs> Here comes that modesty and humility again. Folks, it has been... Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this because we're always interested in giving you a glimpse into the mind's eye of a warrior that's out there doing what needs to be done, not just for his country, but your battle buddies and everybody that's around you because that's really what it boils down to. And Sarge, thank you so much. Thank you for your service, the incredible sacrifices you've made to keep us safe over here because without guys like you, I know we would we would not be as well off. That's exactly right. And, uh Add my compliments in there and my honor. Uh, we want to talk to the Always got to talk about this crisis. real quick. Uh, you can call 1 800 273 8255. Press 1 for veterans' help. 1 800 273 8255. Press 1 for veterans' help. And as always, don't forget, thank a vet. Zero. Right on zero. Beautiful. <laughs> nice. Thanks, <laughs> sir.